There will be some time allocated for Q&A at the end. Uh, so you're welcome to unmute yourself to ask questions when that time comes. And of course, we do have the chat function, which you're welcome to use with, throughout the forum. As mentioned, today's forum is presented by the Banyul Nilambiku Services Network, which began in 1997 and is now the major connecting body for anybody working with young people in our region. We currently have representatives forming our executive team from over 15 different organisations and government agencies that meet monthly with a focus to provide advocacy, training, network and support for the youth sector across our municipalities. The Banyul Nilambik Youth Services Network supports youth workers across Banyul and Nilambik local government areas by providing a number of professional development opportunities for our youth services network. This includes Hit the Ground Running, a one-day induction for new workers to the area, which includes a bus trip to visit local services and learn about referral pathways and options for young people. It also, it also is a fantastic day to network with others from your field and our next one we are hoping will go ahead in October. Youth worker forums are provided at least four times a year and include a free or low cost professional development opportunity on topics that you tell us are important. Sessions are include, also include networking and time for agency updates. Yammer is our social media platform that workers can log on to to share, promote, ask questions and connect with others. And we're gonna provide a link to our Yammer group in the chat if you're interested in joining. We also have our regular e-newsletter that is distributed across the youth sector in Banyul and Nilambik on a monthly basis. And again, we'll provide the link to this in the chat um, if you wish to subscribe. Um, the Principles Network Breakfast is another initiative that's been postponed due to COVID, but we hope to get off the ground again in the coming months. The objective is to facilitate a space in which schools can establish partnerships and information sharing pathways to create improved responses for young people's needs and issues. And finally, we are always looking for your feedback and input into the type of support you would like from the network in the future as well. So today we'll hear from Bianca Johnson and Candice Butler from Youth Support and Advocacy Service, YSAS, who will discuss how adolescent development impacts a young person's experiences of family violence, including intimate partner violence, data, local trends, and the complexities that COVID-19 has created. This will be followed by some further discussion around practical tips and strategies to supporting a young person experiencing family violence and intimate partner violence, followed by time for Q&A at the end. We also encourage you to utilise the chat function in Zoom to ask questions along the way, and we have Kirsty from Headspace kindly mon monitoring these throughout. Our first speaker today is Bianca Johnson. Um, Bianca is a criminalist and criminologist and social worker with more than 14 years of direct practice experience with young people in both Queensland and Victoria. She's worked across diverse areas, including community development, youth AOD, family violence, crime prevention, and early intervention. Her work has ranged from individual support, group work, youth advocacy groups, research and workforce, and sector capacity building. The YSAS Family Violence Capability Project focuses on translating and embedding family violence capability to the Victorian youth AOD sector. Recently, as a part of this project, Bianca undertook a statewide exploratory research into the co-occurrence of adolescent development, substance use and family violence. Bianca is currently completing a Master's of Philosophy via research in relation, to, in relation to young women's experience of adolescent intimate partner violence. She's, committed, she's a committed advocate for violence prevention and is leading practice change in Victoria. We are also joined today by Candice Butler, Candice has been working with young people for over 17 years in Victoria and South Australia. She has an academic background in community development and criminal justice, and a strong background in working with young people involved in the youth justice system and the AOD sector. Candice's experience, Candace's experience working with young people ranges from AOD residential rehabilitation settings to youth custodial settings, group work, intensive individual case management, family work, program development, and advocacy. Candice also has a background in arts practice with over 10 years of experience facilitating therapeutic dance, music, and spoken work, word poetry workshops with young people. Candice works from an intersectional framework with a strong focus on anti-racism and anti-oppressive practice, and also on family violence and gender equality. Candice is a local advocate in the sector, known within YSAS for leading cultural change within the organisation. Candice, Candice is currently working as the team leader of the Youth Support Service North, and early intervention crime prevention program supporting young people 10 to 18 years and their families with holistic case management support. So I will now hand you over to uh, Bianca and Candice who are our guest speakers for today's session. 
Thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. Welcome to today's session. I would just like to start off by uh, acknowledging country, um, acknowledging that all of us will be sitting this morning on on, on land uh, from different traditional owners. Um, so myself being in the Gunnamul and Bullock land and many others being on other parts of Wurundjeri and Bunurong land. Um, and just acknowledging that we are, we are living and working on stolen black land and sovereignty was never ceded. And we wanna acknowledge all elders, past, present and emerging and acknowledge all other Aboriginal people who might be part of the, the forum today. Um, I think it's really important for us also to acknowledge what's happening globally for black and, black and brown people um, at this point in time. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has obviously been something that's been on everybody's lips in the last few weeks after the death of George Floyd. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that the Black Lives Matter movement is not new. It's something that has been around since 2013 and is part of ongoing struggles for black and brown people, including Aboriginal people here in Australia over centuries. Um, and the world seems to be now waking up to that at a different level. It is a point where a lot of change can occur, but it will also be having a big impact um, on many pe young people that we work with and indeed many of our colleagues. Um, and it's important to acknowledge how um, this movement, um, we, we need to acknowledge that anti-racism um, and anti-oppressive practice and self-determination needs to underpin all of the work that we do within the family violence sector. So I'll hand over to Bianca for further acknowledgements. Oh, thank you, Candice. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet. I'm meeting on Wurundjeri land today and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as the traditional custodians on the land of which we're all meeting. Um, also today, I'd just like to flag that we're talking about the topic of family violence and I'd like to acknowledge the strength and resilience of um, victim survivors of family violence and it, the courage that they exhibit and continue to exhibit. Um, I know today's topic might be, um, it could be potentially triggering for any victim survivors in the room and it's a Zoom meeting so please enact self-care strategies as you need during the course of today. I'd also just like to acknowledge the background work and the hard work that's been done by um, Banyol and Nilambik local councils as well as Greenspace, um, Greensboro Headspace and just, um, you know, give my gratitude and acknowledgement of the work of folk. Jess, Katie, Nicola and Kirsty, and my colleague Candice in preparing for today's forum as well. Thank you. And I'll hand back over to Candice who will start our session. Great. Um, so really to begin, we just want to uh, center ourselves um, in looking at some of the drivers of violence um, and acknowledge that this session will work as per state and federal frameworks like Change the Story, like the Royal Commission into Family Violence on the assumption that family violence is caused due to gender inequality. And when we talk about gender inequality, we're talking about the, the belief that one person's gender gives more privilege, entitlement to power, control and decision making than other people. Um, so there are four expressions that we identify of gender inequality that lead to violence against women and children. Uh, and these expressions include condoning of violence against women and their children, men's control of decision making and limits to women's independence, stereotyped uh, constructions of masculinity and femininity, um, and disrespect towards women and male peer relations that emphasize aggression. Excellent. Thank you, Candice. Um, I just wanted to also uh, define a bit of key terminology that we're going to use today. Um, there's just, we're going to go through quite a few concepts and we'll have an opportunity to break them down a bit further during the Q&A as well if we don't cover it in their entirety during today's session. But I wanted to flag that we use the term victim survivor throughout our, throughout our session today. And um, this term uh, acknowledges the strength and courage that victim survivors experience um, in the face of intimate partner violence and also family violence. We also use the term young person who uses violence. Sometimes the term can be um, adolescent who uses violence or adolescent violence in the home. But I'd just like to flag that for the course of today, we'll be using the term young person who uses violence. And this is because it, um, of concern surrounding, um, you know, stigma and also recognizing young people's um, capacity and opportunity for uh, intervention and diversion and early um, changes in, tra in trajectories where they go. Um, when we refer to adults using violence, we use the term adult perpetrator of violence today. I'd also just like to flag that there's three different typologies that we refer to during the course of today's session. One is young person who is a victim survivor of adult perpetrator violence. 
So this can be young people who are victim survivors of violence perpetrated by adults in their life, whether they're um, parents or caregivers or relatives, um, older siblings. And this refers to young people's experiences of both current and historical and directly or witnessed. We also, when we talk about young people who use violence, we're talking about young people who may use violence within um, family context or home context. And that can include against um, relatives, kinship members, siblings as well. We also are gonna talk in a bit more detail about the term adolescent intimate partner violence. And I will go into this in a bit more detail throughout today. But this involves tactics of power and control that's used within adolescent intimate partner relationships. There's just a few things that I wanna flag when we talk about these issues. One is that for young people who may experience violence or use violence, unlike adults, there's often a shorter overlap um, between often their childhood or current adolescent experiences family violence and potentially their use of violence within situations. The other thing is that all those three typologies, young people using violence, young people who are victim survivors of adult perpetrated violence, and adolescent intimate partner violence can co-occur. They don't always occur separately. And so I just wanted to define those key issues before we move into the next part of today's talk. And Candice, back to you. Yeah, so um, importantly, we'll address adolescent development. Um, and to do that, I need to just explain a little bit about intersectionality, which is a buzzword I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of. Um, but in the context of this session, intersectionality um, is about the different dimensions of a person's life and how power might currently impact or have historically impacted that person's experiences. Um, some people will experience multiple forms of discrimination due to factors including age, gender, sexual orientation, race, ableism, geographic location, class, culture, and socioeconomic um, status as examples. Um, so intersectionality addresses how these different dimensions, as the name suggests, intersect. Um, and we cannot view family violence in isolation from all of these intersections. Um, adolescent development um, is one of those dimensions which intersect. It is a key intersection, and that is a, it's a point of advocacy for us here at YSAS, um, viewing adolescence as an intersection. So adolescent development is an important intersection to consider for a number of reasons. Um, it may mean that there are barriers in accessing power and resources for young people. Adolescence might mean that young people experience stigma and their experiences may not be taken seriously. Um, they may be ineligible for certain programs due to ser uh, and, and services, sorry, due to their age. Um, it may mean that there's barriers for them in seeking support and they may struggle to navigate complex service systems that aren't developed with their needs and developmental um, stage in mind. Um, these intersections can create vulnerabilities and also compound the frequency and severity of violence for different young people in very different ways, depending on what forms of oppression are intersecting in their lives. Um, I won't go too too much into adolescent development as a whole as you know many of you being youth workers will be very familiar with adolescent development but i think it's important to just acknowledge at this stage that more recently um, we now view adolescence as extending right through to up to 25 years of age in terms of development uh, cognitive development not just physical development and that adolescence includes a number of areas of development not just physical puberty so it's also important to acknowledge intimate gender and sexual identity formation autonomy seeking that occurs um, uh, during adolescence, expanded social relationships occurring during adolescence, and the making of meaning during adolescence. I think it's important to highlight with intimate gender and sexual identity formation, um, you know, during adolescence, um, a young person's sexual awareness, expression, and first experiences of sexual intercourse frequently occur during adolescence, and young people enter intimate partner relationships for the first time, where they might be required to learn, express and navigate emotions, sexualities, communication, consent, and sexual health, which is a very new domain for them coming into adolescence. Um, you know, a, a autonomy seeking, although self-explanatory in a lot of ways, um, is important to highlight, you know, involves um, uh, exploration, experimentation, risk-taking, and the negotiation and testing of boundaries um, as a young person moves into adulthood. Um, and that that process um, of individuation can cause a lot of concern and anxiety within family relationships and working in family violence. It's important to consider that within family systems, um, viewpoints and lenses that we view this with. Um, and in terms of making meaning um, during adolescence, this is a time where young people are consolidating and making meaning about their worlds and finding their place in it. Um, so just generally talking about impacts of family violence on young people, um, 
family violence can impact the way that young people's identities, emotions, making of that meaning and relationships and other key developmental domains evolve as they transition into adulthood. Um, so young people's cognitive, social, relational, problem solving and emotional systems are all being consolidated, being formed at this time. And we know from research that human instigated actions are the most critical forms um, of disruptive stresses that young people can experience. So abuse of power and control that occurs during family violence can, can significantly impact these developmental processes and alter young people's perceptions of the world as a safe place, um, their, their perceptions of themselves and their sense of meaning in the world. Um, so uh, different trauma behaviours um, can be experienced by young people in response to family violence. Um, as a result, young people may blame themselves for the violence that's occurring. They may have lower self-esteem, um, lack of sense of control in their life and, and carry feelings of worthlessness. Um, young people may have learned to self-silence and to become passive in order to appease perpetrators as a way of surviving family violence. Um, living in a constant state of fear and anxiety may mean that dysregulated emotions um, are commonplace for young people in in those family violence situations. Um, young people may have normalized the power and con uh, power and control and abuse situations that they're experiencing and may see this as normal, acceptable behavior. Um, Self-harm and self-injury can also occur as a response to trauma and as a coping behavior. Young people may engage in disordered eating um, as a way of containing, uh, sorry, of obtaining control over their bodies and over their lives as a result of self-objectification perhaps as well. Um, risk taking at a level beyond normal adolescent development may also occur. Young people may abscond from home as a way of maintaining their safety and avoiding conflict. Um, and young people may also use substances as a way of managing their trauma and managing their emotional response to their experiences. Um, so bringing this back to intersectionality and adolescence as an intersection, we need to acknowledge that young people um, may experience many vulnerabilities uh, resulting from their age. Um, so that might include access to safe alternative accommodation, transport, finances, and other basic resources. And as mentioned before, absconding from home to protect themselves or avoid, co avoid conflict, um, it may mean that young people are more visible in public spaces and may be experiencing homelessness. And these two things can often bring young people to the attention of police and justice system more readily. Um, in addition to that, young people might engage in survival behaviours, such as shoplifting essentials, um, survival sex, which place them at further risk of harm and exploitation and also at further risk of contact with the criminal justice system. Um, so for young people, um, they'll obviously be using whatever resources they've got at their disposal to make decisions to keep themselves safe. Um, and this might include using resources like their social groups, social networks and peers, um, which can be a great support at times, but at other times um, may be another point of vulnerability. And those social groups and peer groups may attempt to leverage young people's vulnerability and potentially make those situations unsafe as well. So as workers, we, we've got to really consider the context of young people's actions and behaviours, um, including actions that young people might be undertaking to keep themselves safe. Um, and Bianca will have a little bit of a chat with you now about poly victimization and how that feeds into this. Awesome. Thanks, Candice. And thanks for doing that recap of adolescent development because it's such a complex part of young people's lives. And so that was an amazing ability just to recap it so quickly and so succinctly. Um, I just want to talk about this concept called poly victimization. So poly victimization is a criminology term. And we know that the term poly means many and victimization often as it sort of, you know, obviously sounds, refers to experiences of being um, victims of crimes and assault. Now, what we do when we look at poly victimization is that we look at multiple forms of really intense trauma and how they can, um, I guess, compound and create really complex experiences and behaviours, in this case for young people. Um, the behaviours that occur as a result of poly victimization are actually beyond the bounds of post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, they can, they're very highly complex. So they can include things like emotional dysregulation, impulsivity, um, disassociative responses to stress, reactive aggression, relational issues, um, and self-injury. It can also extend to a form of pathological ad adaptation. So essentially, if you're a young person and you're within an environment that um, you know, it's an environment that creates a lot of fear and terror and hurt, and it is a sense of inescapability. Um, 
young people, you know, and all people show like a lot of sort of um, resource and adaptation to this, you know, in order to survive. And, um, you know, prolonged exposure to these sorts of things can lead to young people engaging in quite highly complex um, trauma behaviours, including things like emotional numbing and outward expressions of insensitivity, insensitivity like defiance. It can also um, create things such as um, emotional dysregulation and I guess like really directly impact the way that a young person perceives the world and make meaning the world of the world as being a safe place. The reason that I want to talk about polyvictimization is that it's a really helpful conceptual framework for being able to understand young people's trauma behaviours, particularly young people that have experienced ongoing trauma as a result of family violence. Um, young women are actually at significant risk of uh, polyvictimization, and that's because they're at higher risk of um, the sorts of uh, you know, as we know, as we've talked about earlier today, and I guess as we know as practitioners, like family violence is a gendered issue. And so we know that family violence and sexual assault and sexual trauma disproportionately affects women. So um, we do know that, like, as a result, we do need to start to, fr like, consider ways that we're framing young people's um, responses to uh, quite severe trauma, including the compounded trauma of family violence. I'm just going to adjust that lighting again. I'm still getting used to the world of being online with Zoom. And so, but I will hand back over to Candace and um, she'll talk to us a little bit about the next next part, but I'll be back in one sec. <laughs> Thanks, Candace. I've got to get that lighting right. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to touch also a little bit on adolescent development as a barrier to support seeking. Um, so we know that a lot of family violence remains underreported. Um, and this is particularly so in relation to young people's experiences of family violence. Um, and many of the complexities arising from adolescence might impact the young person's ability to seek support. Um, and, you know, so when, when we talk about that, we, we're thinking of things like young people worrying about punishment from parents or authorities, particularly if they have uh, dicey relationships with police and negative experiences in the past with police. Young people might feel a personal sense of, of failure or embarrassment or shame um, around being a, a victim survivor of family violence. Um, they might worry about their confidentiality not being maintained if they do disclose to workers and service providers. Um, they might worry that their experiences won't be believed by the adults around them and indeed other young people. Um, those young people, you know, rightly so at that stage of seeking independence at that point of adolescent development might insist on, on handling things uh, on their own and doing things their own way. Um, or they may even deny that issues exist. Um, you know, they may not disclose abuse because of fear of retaliation from perpetrators, may not disclose due to safety concerns for other children in the household, younger siblings and other family members or other kin. Um, there may be negative stereotyping and stigma around, um, around the issues that will make young people feel like um, perhaps they won't be taken seriously and a sense of distrust perhaps towards adult figures and authorities that may make them hesitant. Um, so young people might not have the resources that they require to assist them in engaging in supports. Um, they may be dependent on public transport, they may live in geographically isolated locations, um, and their experiences also with unstable accommodation, um, such as couch surfing um, and moving from place to place might create barriers in terms of being contactable, particularly if mobile phones are frequently lost or broken. Um, and it might impact their ability to be able to commit to session-based models. Um, perpetrators of family violence might also directly block, undermine or sabotage young people's attempts to access and regularly attend support. And that's something that we've definitely seen during COVID, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, so I'll hand over to Bianca for um, a little bit about adolescent intimate partner violence. Excellent. And I've adjusted the lighting here now so I can actually see the screen again. Um, so like adolescent intimate partner violence is an area that I've done a lot of work in over the years, but it's also an area that I'm doing a lot of research in at the moment. And um, uh, it's, it's a very, adolescent intimate partner violence is a really under-researched area. There's been, a, you know, and there continues to be a really great emerging amount of research into um, family violence. But what we do know is that a lot of um, research that has been done in family violence in the past has really focused on adult power discourses as well as the impacts for very like small children. Adolescent intimate partner violence um, has been lack of the scope of research that I've been looking in. I've had to look internationally um, because there is like a real gap in this area. 
and particularly in terms of um, even local discourses and how it works like within a local perspective. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of different terms for it because the term adolescent intimate partner violence, um, I guess when you're talking, it involves a lot of similar family violence behaviours, but how they um, play out within adolescent intimate partner relationships. There's some key differences that young people experience compared to the experiences of adults. And there's some key strengths and also opportunities for working with young people, but also some vulnerabilities, um, which as Candace has talked about, we look at the intersection of adolescent development. Now, other terms for adolescent intimate partner violence, uh, the term teen dating violence is used quite commonly in the US. I always find that term a little bit disconnecting. <laughs> and, um, but I also don't like the term teen, so. Um, sometimes it's referred to as dating aggression and sometimes adolescent relationship abuse. And I actually came across a term the other day in research which referred to it as courtship violence, which to me also seems a bit old school. Um, but what it does is that irrespective of the term, it's an important term and an important concept for us to understand because the impacts and the behaviours that are exhibited during adolescent intimate partner violence are very significant and very serious. Um, although some behaviours that, you know, begin within adolescent relationships that involve adolescent intimate partner violence might desist or stop over a period of time. There has been some research from 2015 in the US that had a, a big look at this, and it actually found that 30 to 50% of adults who either experienced or used family violence had um, behaviours within their adolescent intimate partner relationships that were indicative of adolescent intimate partner violence. And this is, I guess, is another area that, which, you know, another sort of point that makes this really important as an emerging area of research is that most of the research that's been done about this, a fair proportion of it comes from the US and it's not always directly transferable to an Australian or an early adolescent setting because most of the participants are usually um, like college age students. Now, what we do know in terms of family violence being a gendered issue is that adolescent intimate partner violence is also a gendered issue. And um, women aged 25 years or younger are one of the higher risk groups of suffering intimate partner violence than any other age group. And that's an Australian Bureau of Statistics um, stat from 19, like the 90s. But we also know that um, young women are up to three times more vulnerable to intimate partner violence than women of any other age group. And that's a 2015 stat. Now what happens in adolescent intimate partner violence is that similar types of abuse can occur to um, adult family violence. So things like emotional abuse or physical abuse, you know, um, sexual abuse, like psychological abuse and things such as financial abuse as well. But it's a little bit different for adolescents. Often, and there's a couple of different reasons for this. One is that young people may not necessarily be living with their partners. And then, you know, so we start to see ways that these um, power and control tactics can flow out over things like through technology, you know, monitoring and controlling um, through things like social media and through phones. We also see um, a lot of abuse that occurs within this context can one, there's a lot of barriers to being able to seek support due to being an adolescent, as Candace talked about. But secondly, there's also a lot of things that can be unique to young people. So for, to start it with, like adolescence is the time where young people are starting to, one of the key goals of adolescence is, um, you know, sexual and relationship identity formation. And during adolescence, that's when we see people starting to have their first intimate relationships over the course of their life. Uh, there can be modelling from adult relationships here, but there can also be quite a lot of, um, you know, the issues and the behaviours that occur here can have lifelong impacts for young people. Um, what we do see is that things such as verbal abuse can often target parts of young people's bodies um, or parts of young people's development that are particularly sensitive to that time. So things such as like young women's changing bodies but we also see it with things such as reproductive coercion as well, where we start to look at, um, you know, young people often having sex for the first time. And we can see quite a lot of coercion about sort of, you know, particularly like contraception, um, you know, the way that bodies present. And in saying that as well, there's also been quite a lot of research that has linked um, adolescent intimate partner violence with the theory of objectification, which is where 
uh, essentially when somebody is objectified, they're dehumanized, they're seen as being an object, they're not seen as being a fully formed human. And so objectification, particularly when it's sexual objectification and gendered objectification, can um, look at the ways that society and individuals um, one-dimensionally frame a woman. And so there's been some links between experiences of objectification, adolescent intimate partner violence and disordered eating. The second part that I guess I want to talk about this is that adolescent relationships are quite different in the fact that they're often heavily located within peer groups and there's often a lot of peer referencing about norms of behaviour. And so young people may be more inclined to um, talk to their friends for relationship advice than what they might be inclined to talk to adults within their lives. And if you, there's been research that's indicated that if there's like a sense of normalising of violence within peer groups or that, you know, aggression is an acceptable form within peer groups of resolving conflict, that can be a significant risk factor for adolescent intimate partner violence, which is why things like bystander activation um, responses within adolescence is a really important strategy for young people. It's also um, during earlier adolescence, so, you know, sort of between the ages of 11 to you know, 15, 16 can be a really key time for being susceptible to peer influence. And it's very heightened at this time. Now, at this time, we also have interactions without adult supervision. And I just wanna add a note on that peer influence stuff as well, is that there's been um, research that's linked bullying as well, like social bullying to um, adolescent intimate partner violence, because many of the same tactics that are used in bullying are also can be used within adolescent intimate partner violence. So it's, it is really important that we think about like adolescent cognitive culture in this space. Now there's um, also different to adult relationships. Young people's relationships can be shorter in duration and they often go through this thing called cycling, which is where they might move through relationships a lot quicker. And again, this is part of adolescent development. You're forming your intimate identity in these spaces. But what we do know is that adolescent intimate partner violence has very serious risks, um, very serious outcomes for young people. They can, being a victim survivor of adolescent intimate partner violence can affect somebody's, you know, all the experiences of it can affect somebody's self-confidence, their sense of self-worth, their sense of meaning about relationships. Um, it can also have significant risks in terms of, you know, their safety and, um, you know, and in some of the research that I've been looking at within the last year and also with the family violence project we've done at YSAS, we've been looking at the intersection between adolescent development, adolescent intimate partner violence and substance use overlays and where substance use can be formed as a way of um, managing and coping the stress that occurs due to intimate partner violence and family violence, but can also be used as a way of exerting power and control within these dynamics of relationships. So it is, just to recap, I guess, briefly, and we can talk about it a bit more because Candace has some really exciting um, statistics from the Northern region that I want to be able to definitely make sure she has the time to share. So I will be able to answer this a bit more in questions. But I just want to flag that adolescent intimate partner violence is, um, it is a form of family violence, but it is very focused. It has a really great way of understanding family violence from a developmental perspective. And I also want to flag that it's very real and has serious impacts on the lives of young people. Um, I'll hand back over to Candice to bring us through to the next bit and um, I'll be back soon. Thanks Candice. Um, so yeah, just to add to what Bianca was saying about substance use and adolescent intimate partner violence, um, you know, we need to see it as simultaneously a coping mechanism whilst at the same time a risk factor. Um, so those experiencing intimate partner violence victimization are at greater, at greater risk for substance use. And at the same time, substance use is also a risk factor for intimate partner violence victimization. Um, so that's something really important to acknowledge. Substance use in early adolescence, it can potentially um, predict experiences of intimate partner violence in young adulthood. Um, and also experiences of intimate partner violence victimization in adolescence can lead to an increased um, potential for substance use substance use in adulthood, particularly for young women. So it's something really important to recognize that there is a link. Um, but what we also want to remember is that people cause violence, not substances. Um, and this, as a, as a cornerstone of non-collusive practice, as a cornerstone of anti-oppressive practice, we need to remember that the, the substance use is, um, is, is not the cause, people are the cause, um, and you know, treat it as such and, and make sure that we avoid any sort of um, excusing or collusion 
through talking about substance use with young people when discussing family violence and their experiences with them. Um, yeah, so are we potentially moving into young people who use family violence in the home, Bianca, or were you going to say anything a little more about your project? Or are we? Um, I can talk a little bit more about my project. And I actually just forgot to add um, or didn't sort of expand on when I was talking a bit about adolescent intimate partner violence is that um, there's two things. One is that adolescence is a really key intervention period time. And so as we know from the outcomes of the Royal Commission, young people who use family violence um, and, you know, adolescent intimate partner violence require different responses to what adults do. And these responses have a very strong focus on diversion, early intervention, and providing them with opportunities to create, like, meaningful change so that they don't have a trajectory of family violence in adulthood. The second thing is that adolescent intimate partner violence um, can occur in uh, both heteronormative relationships but also LGBTQ relationships. And... Um, when we talk about adolescent intimate partner violence as being an area where there's a big gap in research, um, LGBTQ plus young people's experiences are also of adolescent intimate partner violence is also an area that um, requires uh, even more research into it. So it is a really emerging area of research, but um, you know, there's a lot of really hopeful research coming out and a lot of really interesting practice support coming out as well. Just in terms of, um, Maybe we'll go into talking a little bit about um, complex emergencies and we can always like expand on some of this in a bit later too um, in terms of young people who use violence in the home, Candice, do you think? Or yeah. yeah, cool. I'm so excited that I can actually see the screen now. The light was really in my face before <laughs> and I felt like I was like, um, but um, all right, let's go into... Um, I might talk a bit about the general impacts of complex emergencies for young people, and then we can get into some of that really exciting Northern data. Sounds good. Excellent. I always feel like whenever we co-present anything, we always chop and change it like halfway through. I'm like, let's do it this order now. So, <laughs> <laughs> like you were good at working together. So I just want to talk about the general impacts of complex emergencies for young people. So, so far this morning, we've spoken a bit about intersectionality. We've spoken a lot about adolescent development. And we've defined um, adolescent intimate partner violence. And we've also touched on the ways that family violence can impact young people. Now, um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, directly about the impacts of COVID-19 for young people. But I want to start that by talking a little bit about complex emergencies. So um, complex emergencies and natural disasters, uh, you know, pandemics um, come under this category. And in Australia, we tend to use a comprehensive approach, like as our national framework for responding to emergencies. Now, generally, when we talk about the impacts of complex emergencies for young people, there's two key points that we have to think about. One is about the immediate safety of a young person. But secondly, we also have to look at the risk of traumatic stress. And so traumatic stress is a type of stress that can adversely impact a young person's emotional needs, behaviour and cognitive development. Now, in adolescence, we know that there's four key needs that are really critical to young people during complex emergencies. This is physical safety, such as food, water, shelter, healthcare access, self-worth, which looks at things like hope, believe in self in the future, um, a positive sense of identity, uh, control and efficacy, which is things such as coping skills and styles and things like developmental needs as well, and a sense of social relatedness. We know that in adolescence, um, due to the transition between, as part of adolescent development, it is a key part in young people's lives where social relationships become really critical for young people. And this is part of that process of autonomy seeking, because as a young person, when you're very, like when you're a child, um, you're very dependent on a lot of your, your parents or caregivers to make um, decisions about your safety. And you tend to sit within like a sort of, a, um, you know, a different uh, dynamic, whereas one of the key goals of um, adolescent development is the transition to adult autonomy and adult independence. Part of doing this is, you know, developing your own way of making meaning about the world and um, starting to, you know, to do that, we start to expand our social relationships. So that's why when we look at things like adolescent intimate partner violence, we see the importance of like peer referencing and peer group norms. But we also see that in terms of um, the social capital and social support needs of young people, they are very heavily engaged, like in a social relatedness term. Now, when general emergencies um, and complex emergencies occur, it can have a direct 
impact on important connections and relationships in young people's lives. It can also be really disruptive to things like important routines, um, supports and networks, and things like, say, you know, school or uh, employment, things like public transport, uh, which is a key way that young people, um, you know, get around family relationships. And what this does is it creates a diminished sense of like control and autonomy and agency within young people's lives, which in turn can create feelings of anxiety, emotional dysregulation, a feeling of hopelessness about the future and a sense of disruption towards their goals. There can also sometimes be ways that this is externalized through um, hostility too, and also aggression. Young people might uh, also just have like a general sense of just losing, you know, the world feels like it's losing control and they feel like they've lost a lot of control in their life. Um, sometimes as a response to that, young people can become quite withdrawn and um, this can create, I guess, a bit of a cycle where it sort of re further reinforces the sense of isolation. There's actually been um, some research that indicated that avoidant and internalized coping mechanisms in the face of complex emergencies has been related to a higher um, experiences of depression experienced by young people following complex emergencies and disasters. And so when we start to look at responses and ways of supporting young people, we have to look at things like, um, you know, strategies for resilience and coping, but also recognition of like the complex ways that trauma occur here. And I do want to talk a little bit about um, actually, I'll talk about the resilience stuff after you, Candice, because I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, hear a bit about how COVID has impacted young people in the North. Absolutely. And look, just before I get into some of the trends that we've sort of been noticing in the Northern region, I just wanted to acknowledge as well that um, for family members and caregivers who are victim survivors um, of, of violence um, experienced at the hands of young people using violence in the home, there might also be barriers to reporting and, um, and support seeking that centre around parental shame, guilt and stigma. Um, that, surrender, that, that surround our parental fears of criminalization for the young person, as I think I've mentioned before, um, and concerns in terms of safety and possible escalation of that violence and lack of alternative accommodation options for those young people. Um, and so I think, you know, it, uh, moving into discussing um, these these trends that we've noticed in the North, there's a lot of interplay there between how parents will experience these issues and how young people will experience these issues around young people using violence in the home. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge firstly before I go into this um, discussion around the data and trends in the north that obviously I'm speaking from the perspective of uh, you know the youth support service working with young people in the justice system um, and also having spoken with other workers within YSAS working in the AOD sector um, and a lot of times we're working with young people who are at the really pointy end of the spectrum and there will probably be a diversity of experiences across um, different um, parts of the youth sector um, across the northern region um, but I thought it would be helpful for us to sort of share with you what what we've um, what we've experienced and seen throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, so what we've noticed particularly in YSS um, is that there's been an increase in severity and frequency of incidents of family violence for young people who were already experiencing some form of family violence pre-COVID. Um, that was very pronounced. Um, there's um, you know, perhaps a lack of access to supports and surveillance that had usually come from contact with workers and services and schools in the community, and perhaps this is contributing to this. Um, I wanted to just highlight that this doesn't necessarily mean that there's not any new family violence happening, um, but that it's highly likely that those who are experiencing family violence for the first time uh, are less likely to be linked to service systems already and less likely to potentially have opportunity and access to report because of that lack of um, contact with services and schools um, that they'd normally have in person in the community um, who might pick up on the fact that there's some signs of family violence occurring and, and do some investigation and intervention. Um, but this also speaks to the fact that, you know, once again, as we, as we said with substances, pandemics don't create abusers, um, that abusive behaviour and thinking patterns are already there and the pandemic simply creates more opportunity for abusers to potentially target victims and uh, victim survivors with coercive control and other behaviours. Um, so, in light of that, um, perpetrators, um, we're, we've become aware that perpetrators have been using COVID-19 restrictions to exert control um, and, and coercive behaviour over young people in the home, including unreasonably restricting their movements and communications with the outside world beyond what's required by COVID restrictions by using COVID restrictions as an excuse and perhaps lying about what those restrictions entail. 
um, abusers have also been lying about um, being infected with the virus and making threats of infecting others in the home um, as a way to control young people and or their parents and caregivers by threatening to infect young people. Um, young people have also had significant experience of adolescent intimate partner violence during COVID. Um, and a good example of that is perhaps that some young people who are already living independently have had experiences of abusive partners coming to live with them in their home in lockdown, so to go into lockdown together, um, only to find that those partners then perpetrate controlling and abusive behaviour during that time, during lockdown, um, with incidents sometimes resulting in property damage and this sometimes jeopardising the young person's housing in some cases leading to homelessness. So we can see that there's a flow and effect um, of intimate partner violence. Um, and also for young people who are not living with their, with their partners, um, experiencing that uh, coercive control um, via social media um, and, and other electronic, uh, electronic facilitated abuse um, and communications um, facilitated abuse. So also issues around loss of employment, which was very pronounced during COVID-19 and still continues to be a very big issue within COVID-19, have had an impact um, with perpetrators who've lost employment being in the home for significantly larger amounts of time, um, increasing opportunities to perpetrate abusive behaviour and decreasing young people's opportunities to seek assistance without the constant control and surveillance by the perpetrator and also with less contact with external services and community supports. Um, increases in alcohol and other substance use by perpetrators in the home have also had an impact. Um, but again, as, as we mentioned before, substance use doesn't cause abuse, people do. Um, and alcohol has often been used as, as an excuse to minimize um, and, and for the perpetrator to avoid taking responsibility. And we've definitely seen this within COVID. Um, at YSS, during COVID, uh, staff have been required to make increasing numbers of child protection notifications, and I think that's, that's also true amongst the AOD team, many of these notifications being around family violence. Um, and we've seen increased levels of child protection involvement. Um, this is somewhat further complicated by the fact that um, during COVID-19, um, the child protection are keeping on newly open cases at investigation stage. Um, and additionally, there have been some longer wait times for family support services, which have meant that families have been left feeling as though they've had minimal supports, um, which had a big, a big impact for young people in those families. Um, additionally, telephone only support um, by many services, while absolutely necessary during the pandemic, has meant that young people have perhaps become less visible in the assessment process and that perpetrators have been more able to obscure and hide signs of abuse and limit young people's communication with workers. Um, so as we touched on before, um, we have seen an increase in issues around housing and homelessness for young people, compounded for many by access to income. Um, so young people who may have fled the home after family violence perpetrated against them, um, young people uh, experiencing homelessness may do so after um, family violence where the young person's had an IVO taken out against them with conditions excluding them from the home. This is something we've seen a bit of. Um, in some cases, young people who are both victim survivors and who are using violence in the home have been mistaken as perpetrator only, um, with some adult perpetrators using power dynamics and weaponizing the use of police involvement as part of a pattern of controlling and coercive behavior um, and homelessness uh, being used as a threat or a method of control by adults in the home. Um, indeed, we've seen some young people who've actually been exited from the home uh, by parents who had concerns about young people not adhering to social distancing rules, leaving those young people without safe accommodation. Um, and I think this also really speaks to perhaps the, that sense of helplessness also that the parents were feeling um, without access to many services um, and, and struggling to find ways to manage dynamics within the home and manage social distancing within the home with their, with their young uh, adolescent uh, people in the home. Um, so for young people who are New Zealand citizens um, and, mm. and citizens of uh, non-Australian citizens living here, the lack of access or delayed access to income and benefits um, and service system eligibility has posed additional barriers for young people experiencing the intersections of homelessness and family violence during COVID. Um, the lack of income or citizenship leaving them with less options for housing, less income, um, and leading them to take up unsafe housing options quite frequently. Um, in, so we've seen many young women in particular have been targeted by perpetrators aware of their lack of options, um, with many young women engaging in survival sex and perpetrators exploiting that power dynamic exacerbated, exacerbated by the impact of COVID through uh, housing, through access to substances, 
um, as, as ways to perpetrate that control. Um, we've also seen an emerging trend of young men being exploited in the community uh, to sell substances or commit crimes by adults in the community in exchange for substances, clothing, phones, sexual favours, um, often leading to perpetration of violence against these young men by adults targeting them and again weaponizing the threat of or use of police involvement in those situations. Um, so for many of these young people, homelessness uh, service system has been a maze to navigate um, and many have found it quite difficult accessing emergency accommodation and material aid despite um, efforts of the, of the sector to try and make things as accessible as possible. Um, but the reality is, is that a lot of service provision has changed drastically. The model of service provision has had to shift and alter within COVID and finding options for staying with friends and extended family has been made more difficult by young people due to restrictions around self-isolation um, and thereby limiting young people's options for accommodation, um, you know, should they be exited from or flee from the home. Uh, and the perception by young people that many services are closed um, or simply not available during COVID has been a big barrier to young people seeking help. So information sharing with young people about service provision changes, et cetera, has been incredibly important in this time. Um, I wanted to also touch a little bit on, on drug and alcohol. So the YSS AOD programs have noted um, significant changes in patterns around substance use for young people um, in the North as many other regions. Um, but in the North, um, you know, these intersections um, between substance use and family violence have been pronounced. Some of the things that we've noticed, particularly in the North, are an increase in use of alcohol due to availability, increase in use of street brought pres prescription medicines, notably Xanax, um, a doubling in the price of some substances in some areas, such as cannabis in areas of the North, um, and therefore decreased access. And in some cases, this means forced withdrawal for some young people who may have been smoking quite frequently or on a daily basis prior to COVID hitting. Um, reduction, reduction in availability of other substances as well, such as ice, which again has caused some forced withdrawal for some young people. Um, and also decreased availability of substances and access has at times meant, uh, as, as aforementioned, the perpetrators have been able to use access to substances as a form of control to target young people. Um, one thing that's also come up from some of the members of the Banyol Nilan Book Network that we would noted is that schools have had a very different insight into the worlds of young people with online schooling. Um, and having, you know, potentially Zoom, Zoom calls or video classes through Compass and, and Google Classroom with young people getting a bit of insight into their home environments and the dynamics within their homes through those video calls um, has brought about new challenges around reporting privacy, safety, and educating young people about family violence and safety. Um, so whereas, you know, a young person may have been able to come to school previously and not disclose anything about family violence and not have any potentially visible signs um, at, at that point, a, a teacher being able to see directly into that young person's home and seeing what's going on. Um, has, has definitely uh, changed that dynamic significantly and that's been something that's been um, a challenge to navigate for uh, not only teachers but other workers involved with, with school and schooling um, and social workers involved with those young people who are linked with the welfare teams at school. Um, so yeah, I guess now that we've kind of looked at some of those trends and those issues that have come up and I would I would definitely encourage anybody who's part of the forum today who may have noticed additional things and additional trends in the northern region when we do the Q&A to please bring them forward it would be great for us to discuss them and get a better idea of what's happening out there within different services and what people are seeing um, but partly um, well, what we'd like to do now is to move into talking about some of the practical strategies about how to support young people. And we'll start off with a bit of general information about how to support young people with family violence, and then move into some information that's more specific to the pandemic um, and ways that we might need to shift and change our practice to accommodate for the different circumstances within the pandemic. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, you know practical strategies around supporting young people generally, um, a lot of this is very reflective of what we do with adults um, in, in the sense of respecting victims, survivors, agency, dignity and autonomy, working collaboratively with them, co uh, collaboratively with them, sorry. Um, the rights of victim survivors to be involved in decision making um, and recognizing um, and engaging with their perceptions of risk and their expertise of their own situations, you know. Um, collaborative risk assessment, for example, using the MARAM, um, which I won't go into a lot now because you've probably done umpteen trainings around that or are looking to do trainings around that very soon. Um, but it's, it's a very good example of collaborative risk assessment that's um, underpinned by anti-oppressive practice. 
Um, so working with young people who are victim survivors, um, it's really important to explain and support their understanding of evidence-based risk factors and how that might apply to them. Um, it's important to be really honest about rights and responsibilities of duty of care and, of, and confidentiality, given that we know that they're a part of the barriers around support seeking for adolescents particularly is around that fear of confidentiality being breached and um, what that means for them. So being really honest about that from the get-go means that they can potentially share more freely or be more aware of their rights in that situation and what they can share. Um, so challenging Challenging victim blaming, challenging self-blame are really, really important um, for, for working with young people particularly. Um, using active listening skills, but also coming from a strengths-based perspective and exploring resilience, agency and strengths even within that process um, is really, really important. Um, creating opportunities for young people to be involved in the decision making is really important. I mean, um, it's not just about sort of, you know, offering that opportunity and if it's not taken up, just forgetting about it and going on with your, with your safety plan. It's creating ways for that young person to really engage with it and really be actively involved in the decision making process. Um, looking at risk assessments and safety planning, we need to be guided by the young person's expertise um, and also supporting their participation in justice processes, um, such as potentially IVOs, etc. Um, to enable fair outcomes um, and sharing knowledge in relevant, uh, with relevant agencies and stakeholders in, in the system during this time particularly as well will be really, really important. Obviously, we want to take a trauma-informed approach that recognises multiple areas of a young person's life that will be impacted and disrupted by cumulative harm and trauma. Um, we want to make sure that the safety of the victim survivor is paramount. Um, and usually we would talk about wanting to ask open-ended questions um, with victim survivors. However, we've got to recognise that during COVID-19, um, being in the home a lot more frequently and noting that perpetrators may be present a lot more frequently, we need to be talking to young people about if that's safe yet. And asking yes or no questions initially to determine if it's safe yet will be really helpful before you get into potentially more open-ended questions. Um, being aware of the intersections for culturally and linguistically diverse young people and how intersections of racism, um, religious issues, cultural issues, language barriers can impact access to services, and the barriers to reporting uh, can impact mental health, can, the, the impact of community shame and stigma, hesitancy to engage with mainstream services, sometimes hesitancy to engage with culturally specific services um, due to connections and issues around confidentiality in small communities, difficult relationships and histories with police and so on. There, there's many, many things to be considered um, in that area. Um, you know, so being culturally sensitive accessible and respectful is really, really important and seeking secondary consultation with relevant cultural supports and, and relevant cultural support workers um, and involving those cultural supports wherever possible in the safety planning if that's something the client's comfortable with is really, really important. Um, so we want to actively work to make sure that the young person feels safe and supported um, and ensure that that young person is empowered to express their identity, their experiences and be actively involved in the decision making. Um, so this presents some really unique opportunities for intervention and skills building. So we talked a little bit before about adolescent development and the types of skills that young people are developing at this time and the types of cognitive processes that are, um, that are happening at this time. And so there's ways that, um, that we can intervene, um, not just for the short term, but hopefully build long term um, resilience and skills for those young people. So um, education about relationships and risk. Um, so by involving young people, discussing with them, sharing learnings with them, presenting accessible information, um, that helps with their ability to identify family violence, identify risk signs and warning signs. Um, and you know, it's an important skill for young people to learn during adolescence when they're in the process of learning to navigate intimate partner relationships. Um, similarly with autonomy seeking, you know, supporting a young person's um, participation in risk assessment and decision making, that supports their, that need for autonomy and independent decision making and actually assists with that, that part of their adolescent development. And further, further to that, sort of in, in terms of identity and meaning making, and during adolescence, while people are exploring their identities, their experiences of family violence can really heavily impact the way they see themselves, the way they see um, their place amongst others, um, it, you know, it, as we mentioned before, around these issues of self-blame. So it can be a really great opportunity at this point, an intervention at this point, to encourage young people to explore their strengths and resilience 
um, and to challenge feelings of self-blame and powerlessness um, in, in terms of positive identity development during adolescence. It's a key point at which we can intervene and really support that developmental process. Um, so I guess this kind of leads into talk about safety planning. Um, so, you know, I've mentioned safety planning a number of times already, um, but delving into that a little bit further, when we're working with young people, it's important to make sure that safety planning is recorded, it's accessible, it's understandable in a format that the young person can identify with. Um, you know, so this might be written format, it might be images, um, you know, it might be a physical document, it might be messages stored in a phone if that's safe for the young person to do so. Um, and it's really important that these safety plans clearly state actions, responsibilities, resources, and strategies. Um, so as, as we've mentioned many times, it's a collaborative process um, and you know, it needs to ref be reflective of the circumstances and real life context in which the young person is placed. Um, so in terms of safety planning, it's important to ensure that the things that, the, the strategies that we create in the safety planning, um, that young people are willing and capable to access these supports during a crisis. There's no point setting these things up that we know that young people will be hesitant to actually do when it comes to the crunch. Um, and it's important that these, um, that contact details for safe people can be recorded somewhere on the safety plan. Um, you know, we need to look at not only risk factors, but also protective factors. Um, and these might be, you know, individual, social or community focused. It may be, you know, safe people and important people in the young person's life. Um, or with certain identity or personality traits exhibited by the young person. Um, during COVID, young people might be less able to use strategies for diffusion in terms of leaving the home. Uh, that's a common strategy that young people use um, in their safety planning is to actually get themselves out of that physical space, get themselves out of that environment. And during COVID, that may be not possible or may be restricted. Um, so looking at alternative strategies like moving into different spaces in the home, um, getting between themselves, uh, getting getting between the door and the perpetrator, so that there's always you know possibility for exit. Um, moving to spaces where there's less objects that could be used as weapons um, at the accessible in that space. Um, the the DVRC um, the website has got a fantastic. Um, uh, um, part, piece of information around coronavirus and family violence and um, you know tips for survivors and staying safe um, during during COVID-19 so we'll, um, we'll we'll make sure that that link gets put in the chat I'll see if I can try and get that happening now um, but definitely worth having a look at this because whilst it's adult focused um, it, there's also a section there around children um, and also a lot of this could be applicable for using with young young adults and, and adolescents um, so yeah, identifying safety supports within social networks um, and other people's houses who young people can stay at, coded messages that they can use with friends to contact the police if they're in trouble, etc., can be really great um, uh, resources. Um, so you often, often young people are going to be pretty unfamiliar with the law and legal processes, particularly around family violence, um, and potentially might be unaware of the need for collecting evidence um, and how that can benefit in future. Um, and so sometimes their attempts to describe to adults what's happening can be dismissed, can be not taken seriously, um, and young people are acutely aware of this and perhaps at times might have attempted to disclose or attempted to seek help and because of the way that that was communicated and not understood, may be hesitant to try again in future to communicate those things. Um, so reinforcing that need for evidence collection can help in that way if a young person's got a video or a voice recording of what's happened even if they're not using the language that you know a worker might understand at the time about what's happening, that that evidence collection can assist the worker to understand what's really going on. Um, but also help empowering young people to be able to communicate that better, rehearsing with them how to speak to police, what to say to them when trying to report family violence, introducing young people to that language, especially you know if they've had to flee the house at night, for example. Um, you know, and may run into police in the street and be considered to be you know. Um, in public at an unacceptable time and attracting police attention, um, you know, it, teaching them how to communicate and say, I feel unsafe at home. My parents are being violent towards me. Um, I am trying to enact a safety plan for myself right now. It would be dangerous for me to go home. Being able to really clearly say those things and rehearsing that with young people can be really helpful so that if they get put in that situation, that they're able to communicate that and, and avoid further criminalization potentially. Um, 
Yeah, so things to talk about also, you know, in generally young people may need further education about family violence and, and what it is, challenging normalized violence, being able to identify and name abusive behaviors and building confidence to do that. Definitely within COVID-19, that, uh, that's potentially been restricted um, and there's been less access to that. So making an effort to make sure that happens. Um, obviously, ability to use public transport has been affected during COVID-19. Um, and we need to take this into account when safety planning and building safety plans and identifying um, other ways um, to get around um, and other safe places to go that are nearby, potentially within walking distance. Um, and particularly with young people, we need to make sure that these places that we're building into the safety plan are places where there's adult surveillance, where albeit bystander surveillance, for example, being in a public place like a local McDonald's, a 7-Eleven that's open late night, places they can go where there will be adults around who can see what's happening. Um, if access to phones is restricted and other devices, um, we might need to work with young people around how to plan, how to keep themselves safe even without access to a phone. Um, so if you build an entire safety plan around the idea that you'll be able to call this person and this person when something happens and then the phone gets smashed or the phone gets taken from them, we need to have the plan be in place. Um, you know, so locking doors, going into safer rooms, identifying neighbours that they can call out to or signal somehow, um, and who can potentially call the police on their behalf or who they can approach um, to, to talk about what's happening and seek um, some support. Having a go bag is another really important one. Obviously, this is something that, you know, it transfers across from how we work with adults as well, having, you know, prepared, to, you know, things to take with them. But there's potentially uh, other ways during COVID that, um, that other things we might need to pack, you know. So having, having a go bag that includes a portable phone charger, a day's worth of medication if they're taking any medication, some cash, written down phone numbers of contacts, friends, orange, friends, orange door and other support services that they can access if their phone for some reason is taken from them. Um, and during COVID particularly, um, you know, hygiene stuff, uh, you know, uh, pads, tampons, toothpaste, but sanitizer and masks as well could be something that would be really useful to have in a go bag. So if a young person does need to go um, very quickly, but they've got that there ready and waiting. Um, the other thing we can talk about them with in terms of, you know, how to get around, um, obviously, if public transport's not an option, um, Uber might be inaccessible due to cost, etc. Have they got a bike? Is there a bike that they can use to ride and get away quickly and, and get to a safe place? Um, it's really important to help familiarise young people with locations and places where they can get material aid, access food, um, and, and really um, give them as much information as possible about services and how they can access them during COVID-19 and how that service provision might have changed from what they might have experienced before. Um, and preparing them how to, to get to these places via public transport or bike or other methods should they, should they need to. Um, in the absence of sort of local youth centres that they might go to, a lot of young people probably would be, you know, going to drop-in centres um, you know, I think a lot of young people are potentially missing going to JETS, you know, on, on a, the after school and, and engaging with the programs there. It's really important to make sure that they've got contacts or are aware of who else they can contact within local youth services um, because potentially they may not have those contacts stored if they know that they can just drop in on a regular basis normally um, and during COVID that's not possible. Um, there's a couple of other websites that I thought would be really useful for young people. Um, so there's one called What's what's okay at home. Um, and this website's actually got some really useful um, information around um, safety planning for young people. And I think it's actually got like a little um, section where young people can create um, a safety plan. Um, and the really great thing about this website too is that it's got a really quick exit button. So there's a little red box in the right hand corner. So if a young person's looking at this website and a per perpetrator comes into the room, they can click that little, um, exit sign and, and it just goes back to a Google homepage. Um, the other one that we thought would be potentially useful um, for young people could be the ARC website, particularly in terms of um, reporting evidence. Um, and so I'll, pay, I'll post the link for that in the chat now as well. And another one that I thought um, could be potentially useful, um, it's, it's a, an app that's um, been designed for use by the Aboriginal community. Um, it's called Copwatch, um, and it's an app whereby you can actually safely record interactions with police um, through the app, um, and it, it can be uploaded to a cloud automatically so that even if the phone's damaged, that evidence is still there around potential um, interactions with police that go south. Um, and it also has a function whereby young people can enter three different um, contacts, emergency contacts, so that if they are 
um, if there is an interaction with police and they are feeling like that's not a safe interaction for them, that they can press a button and it will immediately send text messages to all three contacts. Um, and whilst this um, could potentially be useful for young people who may have been mistaken as, as uh, people using violence in the home um, and who may have been, you know, caught up loitering um, and, and drawn police attention in, in the community when fleeing from family violence. It could also be potentially useful in other situations for if young people want to be able to alert um, others that they're in an un unsafe situation and have those, those pre-determined um, contacts notified. Um, another really important thing to note is if, if young people retaliate with protective violence and police are called, it's really important that young people are aware of their legal rights their right to have an independent person present when they're interviewed by police. Um, and as I said before about uh, helping young people to learn the language and learn to be able to communicate what's happened to um, legal authorities and, and other adults, um, to, to rehearse with them to how, how to be able to clearly state that they were protecting themselves with violence um, and making sure that they um, potentially in that go bag that they have, have written down numbers for youth law um, and for community legal centres in the north that they can access should they need legal representation. Um, so yeah, uh, the community legal centres in the north are fantastic and, and workers within those spaces will be a great resource for them should, should that come up. Um, worst come to worst, you know, if a young person does have to sleep rough um, or finds themselves in a situation where they end up sleeping rough, it's a harm minimisation to perhaps recommend that they try and stay awake, that they try and stay in a place where there is adult surveillance uh, we've heard of young people attending hospital waiting rooms, um, you know, and th there's a lot of people waiting in there. <laughs> so then mm -hmm. adults, there's light, there's 24 hour, 24 hour restaurants, 7-Elevens, at least kind of being in places where there is some kind of surveillance to keep themselves safe, um, if that's what occurs. But obviously we want, make, we want to make sure that they've got access to information for front yard and, and other housing crisis services, um, you know, before getting to that point. <laughs> Um, I feel like I've been talking for quite a long time now. <laughs> I might get Bianca to, to jump in and expand on a little bit of this. Yeah, no thanks Candice. That was such a great summary and you covered so much um, just then. Uh, yeah, just expanding on what Candice had said, the go bag is an excellent option. Like we know that, um, you know, I often wonder if maybe it would be helpful if there were something that could be pre-packed and even include things like my keys as well. You know, um, but also in terms of just the way that we interact with young people when they are experiencing situations where they might be couch surfing or fleeing situations of family violence or intimate partner violence, we need to remember that firstly, like stress has significant impacts on young people's um, emotional well-being, but also uh, like it can have like impacts on their cognitive development. And it, there can be like a sense of like, you know, this sort of, constant presence of like trauma and holding this trauma. And, um, you know, when we do work with young people in this space, when you think about, you know, experiences of, say you might be couch surfing because home's unsafe, we also can't just assume that couches that you're staying on are safe either, you know, and um, not only is it, you know, I don't like the way often young people have explained it to me in the past is it's a bit like camping. And because I strongly dislike camping and always find it disruptive, uh, you know, but they like, they say things like, you know, it's never really comfortable. You're constantly losing things or you're worried about stuff being taken or stolen from you. And it's hard to get like a full night's sleep because you're not sure who's going to come in or if it's actually a safe place. And so when we think about that in terms of the safety of young people, but also remember the fact that they're doing the absolute best they can in very difficult and complex circumstances to keep themselves safe often in a system that's not um, necessarily responsive to their unique needs of adolescence. And so young people, you know, if they're still getting to school in these situations, that's amazing. That's incredible. But we need to remember that, you know, they may be tired. They're, it may be um, hard for them to focus. Even when we're doing things like case planning and stuff or like working through um, activities together, just being really sensitive to the impacts of things like lack of sleep, you know, constant anxiety, like, concerns about not having, um, you know, readily accessible resources, like, you know, particularly for like young people who might not have an income. I know when I worked in, um, was doing frontline practice, I'd often get referrals for young people who were shoplifting. And then it turns out a lot of them were young women who were shoplifting like tampons and things like that. So, you know, which 
um, you know, starting to think about like how their behaviours fit into the context of their experience, not only in terms of the COVID overlays and restricting access to services, but also the intersections of their adolescent development and their structural and system vulnerabilities that they have. Just a few things like when we're actually thinking generally about intervention work with young people and coming back to that notion of adolescent development, we need to remember that adolescent development is an important part of life for learning skills for future, um, you know, adult independence. And, you know, the way I often explain it to young people is like it takes time to practice. Like, you know, as an adult, we can assume, you know, I'll, you know, be assertive in this situation or take a different perspective. But for young people, this is an opportunity to start practicing the skills to prepare them. So like Candice was saying earlier, things such as being able to rehearse to young people or help them find ways in their language, you know, of explaining, which will also like create red flags or tick boxes for adults to recognize what's going on. You know, help seeking behaviors and support seeking behaviors and being able to articulate that stuff's not okay. We don't want situations where young people have been fleeing violent situations at home or within, you know, households where, the, you know, there's intimate partner violence. And, um, not necessarily having the language to articulate that and then being returned back to the home where they face like, you know, the risk of like retaliation or retributive violence. And we also know in terms of family violence practice that leaving situations and immediately after someone's have uh, left a situation creates like a significant amount of risk because perpetrators of violence um, may engage in even uh, more intense violence or power and control because they feel that their power and control in that situation has been challenged. So when we're doing work with young people, we are also taking into account their developmental needs. And so in any work you do, whether it's like a collaborative risk assessment or actually explaining terminology, like I know I've spoken with young people before and I've been like, look, what's going on here sounds like family violence. And they've said to me, no, family violence, that's like for adults. And, you know, I, you know, not like, hey, it could be adolescent intimate partner violence because that's like still quite a wordy term. But being able to sort of, create connections with young people about what they're experiencing or what they're seeing and actually that this behavior is not okay. It's a form of power and control and it is a form of family violence within an adolescent context. But also just looking at things like where in our support work with them, are we able to support their abilities to, um, you know, be engaged in the process of decision making, things that can support their help seeking behaviors that we've talked about, um, for young people who might be in home environments, you know, like with COVID lockdowns, um, strategies, you know, for managing and tolerating frustration, particularly if there's been adolescent um, violence and or young people using violence in the home. Things like perspective taking and conflict resolution and conflict management strategies and um, self-awareness and also managing their emotions and expectations of others. And um, things like emotional literacy and stuff, like you're always looking at opportunities and intervention with young people to start to embed these skills, you know, or practice opportunities for these skills. I was gonna just talk a little bit too about, we spoke earlier about, um, we've spoken a lot about managing the risks and the safety of young people during COVID and things like um, supporting their ability to be safe, like in these crisis situations. But also, you know, in the future, I guess, we need to also think about ways that we help young people under, you know, when ideally they are safe, understand their experiences that have happened at the moment. And, um, you know, we talk a little bit about resilience and I guess I just want to sort of frame a bit about, you know, uh, resilience in terms of resilience is often perceived as this way to bounce back. Like, you know, an event happens and young people, and victim survivors of family violence, they always exhibit the most incredible amount of resilience and resourcefulness and strength and courage. When we start to look at things coming out of like a, you know, um, like a complex emergency or like a COVID situation, we want to be able to do things about not just assuming that life, you know, you're bouncing back to the way that you were, that life was before, because the thing is life will may not be the same as what it was before, particularly like in the way that COVID could impact like, um, you know, future service provisions or, you know, even like community relationships and networks. So we want to sort of focus with young people about how do we explore the resilience that you showed during that time? How do we draw out your strengths? Partic when young people have been victim survivors of family violence, they can sometimes like have internalized like a lot of the negative narratives and the 
destructive narratives that have been told to them by perpetrators of violence that can really impact their self-confidence and you know their perception and their identity and so we always want to be doing like a strength-based approach and an anti-oppressive approach but also framing resilience as not just your ability to bounce back but your ability to bounce forward what did you you know what was happening during this time what did you uncover about yourself like looking at ways of framing questions where it's like that would have taken an enormous amount of strength to navigate that situation break it down tell me what you did in this this situation and applying that resilience and those strengths to future situations do you know in the future if this happened how do you think that you know that resilience could play into a situation where you might be um challenged at school or something like that you know bringing not just bouncing back but bouncing forward there's this um framework and it looks at things like positive reappraisal and it's about exploring and breaking down things like adaptative um adaptive coping and looking at like the ways that oneself might have learned or positively grown or changed in the face of complex emergencies and then how that can be applied in a future scenario and so that's something that we can think about with resilience and moving forward um just yeah i just you know strongly encouraged you know we we will have like a bit of a summary sheet that we'll send out after this but um the points that candace has made have been completely comprehensive and also um really strongly grounded in both empirical evidence but a lot of really she you know a lot of time spent going through northern data and trends and like you know discussions with um you know like aod and early intervention teams as well to create this excellent rich data that she's discussed and um, I guess the thing I might just add a little bit here as well is when we uh, think there's, there's, we've covered a lot in this session. There's a few things I think that we should also remember is like also for ourselves as workers, because, um, you know, we are also navigating, um, you know, what is like a complex emergency in a pandemic ourselves and the quick switching over to whole new ways of operating and really innovative ways of operating i think just on a side note like i think it's an, a great opportunity for transformational change in the way that we deliver service and innovation i mean even though for me it's taken a long time to figure out zoom and stuff like that and you know i still haven't quite figured out how to change the background yet so <laughs> but i know yeah it's like when you did that candace i was like oh no <laughs> and i was like maybe i'll just put a piece of paper behind me but um i keep thinking of that terrible you know that situation where the person accidentally turned themselves into a potato so i've been really afraid to to try and adjust my background <laughs> but anyway going back to it we need to think about things that we do as workers that maintain our own self-care and our own needs during this time as well and so um you know we talk a lot about vicarious trauma in in our work and that's um you know that's because you know we are often engaging with and working with people who are in states of crises and or people who are in you know facing really challenging and difficult circumstances and so but i think it's also important to think about things like vicarious resilience which is kind of like the counter or the, you know, it's a buffer to vicarious trauma. Oh, sweet. Thanks, Jess. And um, vicarious resilience looks at, um, you know, the strengths and uh, I guess like the ways that um, we grow as workers as well in these situations. It's, you know, it's a really important buffer in terms of like being able to engage, you know, whether we do that through like group supervision or our individual supervision or reflective practice, it's actually exploring our own experiences of vicarious resilience. Um, other things that I think are really important is obviously working together. Like we talk a lot about the theories of collective impact and, you know, even for example, as like Jess and Katie and Kirsty have in Candice have, you know, put together today's forum, it's opportunities for us all to come together and share our knowledge and resource, which collectively strengthens us. Um, you know, our sector and our areas to be able to work together and be aware of what's going on and find innovative solutions. The other thing that I just think is really important is, um, you know, I was also just going to say too, with vicarious resilience, we also talk about compassion fatigue, which is where, um, you know, there can be like a sense of loss of empathy. But in all cases where there's a counterbalance, there's something called um, compassion satisfaction. And I think that's a really important part to add as well as like, you know, not only looking at our vicarious resilience but also our you know a sense of compassion satisfaction 
But lastly, as I was going to say, like a huge experience for young people, we need to remember that this is a period of transition and growth and being able to celebrate young people's achievements and their strengths is so critical in this time. One, because if, particularly if they've had family violence experiences in their home, they may not have had their sense of strengths or achievements celebrated before. If anything, they've probably had the opposite. So this can be really great in terms of, um, you know, celebrating their achievements, really vocalizing and reflecting on their strengths, really acknowledging like specific behaviors or actions they've undertaken um, can be a really important part of like supporting their emotional and developmental needs. But also, um, you know, and that might be, you know, I often just, I guess, like gauge by the feedback from the young person about how they feel is the best way to, you know, do that. Or sometimes you might, you know, if they've not had opportunities to celebrate stuff before, you know, sort of try a few different things out, get them to reflect on that. But also in terms of us as workers, that helps prevent, um, you know, it lets us celebrate young people's achievements, but also, um, I guess, you know, take a pause and actually think about the success of our work and our interventions as well and our own kind of reflective change in that process. So, you know, in like in today, we've covered quite a lot. We've looked at adolescent development quite specifically. We've looked at, you know, complex emergencies, the impacts of um, COVID like generally, but as well like specifically to the Northern region. We've discussed adolescent intimate partner violence. Um, Candice has given some amazing practical strategies. And we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, just like making sure that we take care of ourselves as workers too. And, you know, is there anything that you think you'd like to add to that, Candice? Like, I think, um, you know, I think you've covered it. It's, um, yeah, I just wanted to also thank you for your incredible depth of knowledge that you bring <laughs> and the work that you're doing in your research project is not only groundbreaking for YSAS but for the sector as a whole um, uh -huh. like it's going to be invaluable for us moving forward as a youth sector um, and yeah look I think that you know there's um, there's obviously a lot of issues that we've raised today there's going to be a lot to go away and think about but we'd really love to um, sort of you know get some of your thoughts in the upcoming Q&A session um, I don't know if we're going to sort of allow people to have a bit of a stretch before we start that a five minute stretch would be amazing it's so funny i think the coffee that i've been drinking in the morning has finally kicked in for me so <laughs> uh, well thank you guys before we do go to the q a we might just let everyone have a quick five minute stretch so if you can be back literally in five minutes and we'll kick off with questions and questions you can ask take your mics off have a chat or you can also put them in the chat and we'll monitor those so we'll Five minute break, guys, and we'll come back and get on with the fun part. Excellent. So, 11.38, Jess? 11.38 sounds good. Yep, we'll excellent. Be... See okay. you then. 11.40 start. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right on time. <laughs> I feel like I'm often late to things and I was like, I have no excuse here. I literally had to walk like over there to get more coffee. So <laughs> I was like, I have no excuse for being late. I'm like two meters away from where I need to be. I find the closer you are, the later you are. <laughs> Overestimate. All right. Well, I think we've got all the main people back. So, so for those that don't know, my name's Jess. I'm one of the youth workers at Banyol Council and the youth services team. And I support um, the Banyol Nova Youth Services Network along with Katie. So it's so great to see you all here, Cher. I think from scrolling through names, there's some few newbies that hopefully haven't been before. So I would definitely recommend that you make sure you sign up to our e-newsletter and to Yammer so you can keep connecting. So we run these forums lots through the year and we always want to know what you guys want to know about so there'll be a survey at the end that I'd really encourage you to tell us what you guys want to hear next in your next youth worker forums um Jess, so I, can you yeah. like can you highlight what the next two um potential ones are so that when it comes out people can think about whether they're wanting to attend 
Definitely. So the next one that we're looking at having is very exciting for us. We're actually looking at getting the Resilience Project in. Um, and they, if you haven't heard of them, I'd recommend Googling them. They're working with lots of our young people in our school, local schools across the region, but also work with lots of high profile sports people, um, business people. Um, and their story is all about how to build resilience and how you can use that in life. I know myself, I've been to a couple of their presentations and they're amazing. So we're hopefully going to be having them come September, October is the date. And then we're also going to be looking at um, another one, Kirstie, which do you want to have a touch base about what that one might be about? Bring you in. So Kirstie is the um, service manager at Headspace Greensboro. Yeah, and soon to be Plenty Valley as well. So we've got a satellite site that's starting up there in September. So um, the topic will be um, around um, trauma and recovery um, for young people. So there'll be some research, but also, again, practical strategies. But what I'd suggest is that um, when you receive the information from today and you, <coughs> from whoever sends it out, I think it'll be Jess or Katie, then please indicate if there's particular areas around um, young people with mental health um, and approaching it from a strength-based, um, but tr as well as trauma lens and recovery. So we'll be talking about the some of the triggers, the impacts, um, some theories, some research, and some practical strategies, and some resources that you can refer to, and some um, practical tools that you can use as well. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. So they're the next up and coming two, but again, we're always looking for feedback. These only work if they're you know of interest to you guys. So please always give us positive, negative, everything we want. We want to hear it all. So before we start a QA, I also just want to bring your attention to a very special guest in the room. We have Dal, who is from the Orange Door. So Dal, I'm not sure if you want to turn your camera on and say hello. Um, Dale actually has presented at a Youth Workers Forum previously um, last year. So she did a great overview of what the Orange Door provide, but she's also going to be here today to help us with any questions you may have. And Dale, I might just ask if you could give an overview of the Orange Door, just a quick one before we get into the questions. Okay, thanks Jess. Hi everyone. And um, can you say it's been really interesting this last couple of hours just hearing about hearing from Bianca and Candice. It was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. You both obviously know your stuff really well. You made it really clear and easy to understand. So thank you for that. It was great. Oh, thank um, you. You're welcome. Yeah. So the Orange Door, so we're, um, just very briefly, I work at the NEMA Orange Door, North East Melbourne area, and we cover the five LGAs of Banyol, Darabin, Nillenbuck, which we'll see Yarra, it's five, I think. Uh, we're intake for all family violence and children's wellbeing across NEMA. So it's open for every person of every age, and despite whether you have citizenship or on visa issues or whatever, everyone can access our service. So we provide intake assessment. So basically, we're open Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, uh, we our referrals primarily come through the L17 portal, through um, the telephone line, through emails. Or we also, when we're in the non-COVID days, we have walk-ins. So at the moment, primarily our work's being done over the phone. Our practitioners are all working remotely at the moment. So primarily it's phone contact. However, I'm saying that if there is a need and a person's need cannot be met by telephone or by video conferencing, then we can see people face to face. That can be arranged as well. Um, so really we do the intake, identification of needs, assessment planning, looking at risk and safety of primary areas, the family violence and children's wellbeing. And then really we depend upon the services in the community to refer out to. So specialist family violence, um, the victim survivors and perpetrators, as well as family services, and other areas like YFAS, Headspace, um, homelessness, and mental health or whatever. Refer and make sure that people who um, access the Orange Door are well sort of uh, referred to and linked into the appropriate services in the community refer to that ongoing work with them to ensure there's a bit of the best outcomes they possibly can. That's us, really. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dale. That's fabulous. Um, and I've popped the link to the Orange Store in the chat, so you can grab that if you need. So we're going to open up to questions now. So you can either do that in two ways. You can take yourself off mute and we can have a chat. Um, otherwise, you can pop them into the chat bar and I'm going to be monitoring those and I'll bring them up. Just if you have a specific person you want to answer it, just let us know that too, if you're doing it in the chat. But otherwise, I'm opening it up, guys. Who wants to go first? Always love the awkward silence. Oh, I was going to say, if we do have um, like a gap, it's always, I love when it's Q and A's because I'm like, I end up going off script a lot. <laughs> but I was, so you never know, but um, I can always talk a little bit about my research that I did last year as well to do with the intersections of um, youth AOD, family violence and um, adolescent development. So, because a lot of that has informed some future stuff that we'll be doing too. So. If anyone does have any questions about that, um, that's something that we can discuss a bit more. And also expand on some of the stuff about adolescent intimate partner violence that we sort of went through quite quickly earlier. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, yeah. No, so we, we haven't had anyone coming through yet. But so maybe, Bianca, if you wanted to touch base on that, that would be good. Um, and then if anything comes through, we'll jump to it. Excellent. And I'm actually always the same. It's, uh, it's such a different world talking on Zoom as well. And I often find when it's like opportunities to have questions and people are like, oh, you can put your camera in. I'm like, no, I'm going to use the keyboard. So um, yeah, just because I only talked about it uh, briefly at some, maybe it was even in the middle of the, the forum before, but um, some of uh, people within the North would recognize me from when I was doing some work with YSS, you know, out there for quite a few years. And, um, you know, and all remember me from whenever I dropped into jets as well, Jess. Yeah. But, yep, where I got very good at spray painting. <laughs> and, um, but I, like, um, since then I've actually, you know, at YSIS we've, um, we started a project. We were engaged by Family Safety Victoria last year to have, um, you know, the start of this project was a 12-month exploratory project and it was looking at um, what the youth drug and alcohol sector required to be family violence capable. And so that was actually, um, you know, that looked at like practice, it looked at like structural issues, it looked at settings. And part of that, like, it became really exploratory research. And so I ended up doing qualitative interviews with more than 130 youth drug and alcohol workers across the state last year. And I also did an enormous amount of literature review about the intersection of um, family violence, uh, youth, like adolescence and substance use. And, you know, during the time of that project, we did quite a lot of other things as well. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to go interstate, which feels strange talking about that now because like, you know, I'm excited for when I can go interstate again. But I was up in um, the Northern Territory and also in Brisbane and Cairns in like a variety of different community settings and conferences and things like that mainly talking about young women's experiences of intimate partner violence corresponding with um, AOD use. But some of the, that project accumulated in um, writing, I guess like an online textbook, uh, but also looking at ways, a final report, which hopefully in the future we'll be able to distribute more widely, but it actually looked at the ways that um, family violence experience, uh, like family violence, um, impacted young people's experiences, like how it played into their use of substances, but also um, in terms of, uh, you know, the impacts of family violence on youth AOD treatment and different ways that coercion and power and control um, could create, you know, additional barriers for young people, which were really compounded by the intersection of their age. So I've just seen we've got a question, so I'll put that on pause so we can answer it. Thank you so yeah, much. Judy. Thank you. So the up. question we've got now is, uh, and it's probably open for every anybody, do you have resources for bystander action for young people? And what do you think is the best method in getting this information out to young people? Which I think is such a big thing and, and probably goes across a range of areas, not just family violence. So um, I'll open it up to you guys. And then if anyone else in the, in the crowd has some options too, chuck them in the chat. That'd be great. One thing that I can mention about this is that schools in the region, um, Jodie, have a lot of resources around um, restorative justice programs. Yep. So those programs are ones where they talk about people being upstanders um, and they often educate um, young people around that too. 
The other area is the Safe Minds program, which is, um, there's two areas. One is that the Department of Education have a website around Safe Minds and they do a lot of educating that the Austin Mental Health Promotion Officer and Headspace Community Engagement Coordinator have done over a number of years, but anyone can get that training in Safe Minds. And Safe Minds is a program that works with young people at risk of any type of self-harm, bullying, and all sorts of other potential mental health and other situations. Um, it also has a Safe Minds component for parents at home. So the because obviously we do know that with a lot of these experiences that young people have, a really large factor is whilst we can do some individual work with young people, the sustainability of the work is based on what their family will do in terms of supporting them. So when we talk about youth, we really need to consider them in the context of their families, carers and support people, whether that be their coach at their soccer club, um, their art teacher or their music teacher or a key teacher at school if they're at school or a key contact at university, whatever it might be, there's always someone out there, which is why with family violence at one point, they had um, hairdressers being screened around family yeah. violence. There was a project that came out about that for a while because people often do talk to their hairdressers about a range of things and they could actually identify whether there'd been any physical violence due to doing their hair. So um, the other area is that many schools also talk about values. So the restorative justice um, kind of approaches that some schools do have that. Northern Casa also have a program that they used to run in schools for a term around um, respectful relationships and the department of, and but schools had to commit to that for a whole term and then train up staff. It was quite intense, um, but very useful and a lot of evidence-based um, sustainable practice that changed and impact for the schools that participated. The other area is the Respectful Relationships Program that the Department of Education are also um, continuing to facilitate across different high schools across the region with a range of different projects, some which are more useful than others, I might say. But um, there's a lot of um, evidence that those relationships, uh, Respectful Relationship Programs, there have been recommendations from the Royal Commission as well. Um, and they, there is that key word called upstander rather than bystander. And that is around um, not only supporting people in um, the family violence sector, but it is actually also around supporting people where there's bullying in schools, because that is where it's shown that we need to be doing the work now through research is respectful relationships from a young age around gender roles and stereotypes and it needs to be at a much earlier phase than what we've been doing in the past. And Dell might be able to talk a bit more about that too. Um, uh, Kirsty, no, I was going to mention the Respect for Relationships program, because I know particularly now they've been doing lots of work and I know they've been um, reached out to us the Orange Door and saying, how can we work together in doing this and ensuring that schools are aware, that principals, teachers are aware, how to work with young people around this. And how do we present these programs to young people to actually inform them and actually build their own sort of capacity to move forward? We, we certainly don't have any sort of um, uh, um, programs or inf other information from the Orange Door. But yeah, I think the Education Department's um, one of the main sort of um, stakeholders in actually providing this sort of training and skill building to young people. Um, I think that's really great. And um, I think one thing um, that I found in, in my role, though, in the youth support service is that we tend to have a lot of young people come through who've been disengaged from formal education from a very young age. Um, and so whilst they might have had some of that early respectful relationships education in late primary school, if we're often finding that some of the kids coming through our program are already disengaging with education, even in late primary school. Um, so they, they tend to miss a lot of that. So I think it's also important in addition to the education department stuff for workers in the community to also be empowered with that information and understanding around bystander activation and being able to work with young people who are disengaged from education um, and really uh, uh, introduce some of that information that they may have missed through their disruptive education. Um, so it, I think it's, it, we need to have both, you know, um, and, and it's great if there are resources out there for, for uh, youth workers, social workers and other family workers um, to be able to work around that stuff and, and empower young people with that information. 
Can I just put in the practice of, um, in the context of practice and like um, bi-directional change, which is actually like, as we all know, um, and particularly as said by things like our national frameworks and our state frameworks, is that um, preventing violence against women and children and, you know, preventing family violence actually requires systemic and structural change, you know, and it requires changes in social attitudes. And so there's a lot of um, research that's indicating the importance of like bystander responses in terms of creating cultural shifts um, where people uh, change their norms and um, regulate the norms amongst each other. Part of the reason that it's really important to do this work with young people is that uh, they call it layperson's theories, but essentially a lot of this research looked at uh, the way that young people conceptualise the causes of intimate partner violence and it said that often the causes were there was a real dis, disjoint between how individuals or in the theory term lay persons saw the cause of violence as being individually attributed you know so someone's mental health or someone's substance use so they there was often a real like laser focus on individual factors but there was a real disconnect with the actual way that um experts and violence prevention people understood the causes of violence as being due to um, structural gender inequality. And so an important way that we do the work and through things such as like bystander activation and being able to help young people uh, contextualize and situate violence in terms of broader gender power inequality discourses is by bridging that gap because we want people to understand that family violence has caused the overarching driver, you know, the, the overarching drivers of violence, which Ken just talked about it earlier today. So bystander activation is a really good way of firstly changing peer norms, which is critical in adolescence due to social referencing and the um, high connection that young people have socially at that time, plus their sense of meaning about the world. But secondly, it's really important too, because when there's that real individual focus on the causation of family violence, it can create the risk of things like victim blaming. We want young people to be able to bridge to broader structural causes and also find their ability in, um, to enact agency in those spaces. So that's, you know, I was just thinking Victoria Health actually had like a whole bunch of forums a few years ago and a bunch of resources as well. And so did um, uh, Gender Equality Victoria too, which also spoke a bit about bystander activation. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Well, that's probably all we're going to have time for in terms of questions. So very short lived. Um, but I'll just throw over to Katie. Um, Katie's got a quick survey and a bit of a finish up for everyone. So thank you. Thanks, Jess. All right, yeah, so that pretty much just um, draws our forum to a close for today. So thanks so much to everyone for attending our very first online youth worker forum. Um, really hope you enjoyed it and found it valuable. Um, Bianca and Candice have kindly put together a tip sheet as a follow on from the session today, uh, which we'll, chat, we'll attach in the chat function now, but we'll also um, send it out by email to all attendees as well, because I am aware um, some people have left early. Um, on behalf of the Banyan Olympic Youth Services Network, I'd just like to extend a really big thank you to both Candice and Bianca for all their hard work and time that they've dedicated in the lead up to today um, towards pulling together this fantastic presentation for you all. Um, also, thank you to Dell from Orange Door for coming along to support our Q&A section of the forum. And of course, thanks to uh, Kirsty and Jess for monitoring the chat today to answer any questions and provide some really useful information and links for your reference. Um, and Nicola, who is our Youth Development Officer, who's been um, very busy in the background to record um, today and just helping make sure that our very first youth online youth forum has run smoothly. Um, so thank you again to everyone involved in making today possible. Um, just a quick note too, I thought uh, might be useful for you to know that you can save a copy of the chat from today um, for future reference by clicking on the three dots on the right hand side next to the file where it says file, um, but I'll also send out any relevant, relevant information that's been discussed as well as a link to the recorded forum as well. So you can um, go back and watch that and share it with your colleagues. Um, and as Jess mentioned, before you'll head off, we do have a, a very quick evaluation survey um, that we'd love you to complete to tell us how you felt today went and your feedback for future improvement and ideas for future topics you'd like to see presented. So I'll just post a copy of that survey um, in the link in the chat now. Um, so if you could click that link and complete the survey as you're heading off, that would be great. Um, and unless anyone else has anything to add, uh, thank you again for coming and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.
Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And a massive thanks to yourself, Katie, Jess, um, Del, Kirsty, and Candice as well, and everyone who participated. Thank you. Thanks all for being here. Cool, cool. All right. <laughs>